is Tanya Pearson interviewing Pat Place on March 23rd, 2019 in New York City for the Women of Rock Oral History Project. Thank you so much. Well, pleasure my pleasure. To meet you. Likewise. You're a legend. <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny. Okay, so this is kind of like a, uh, like a this is your life a little bit. Mm -hmm. Start at the very beginning, mm -hmm. work up to present day. Uh, where did you grow up? Uh, Chicago, suburbs of Chicago, mm -hmm. mostly. What did your parents do? Um, my dad worked for a steel company. My mom was a housewife. And did you have any siblings? I did. I had a, one older brother, six years older. Um, what was your relationship like growing up, like little Pat Place? with your parents and your brother? Um, <laughs> oh my God. I think, you know, it, it's funny. I've been thinking about this whole gender issue and everything. I think when I was young, I kind of wanted to be a boy. And so I played with the boys and I, my brother and his friends, but they were quite a bit older. But, um, you know, my girlfriends like to play with Barbie dolls. So I'd be the Ken, so that worked for me. My mother was wondering why I wanted the Ken dolls and not the Barbie dolls. So that was that, was that period. Mm. <laughs> that's, if that answers your question at all. Yeah. yeah. Um, and like, what kind of kid were you? I think I'm thinking like pre-high school. Were you shy? Did you, were you like, were you outgoing? Were you creative? Were you a nerd? Like, mm -hmm. <laughs> Probably kind of shy and uh, creative, and um, but no, I had friends. I wasn't like I, I don't I wouldn't I didn't think I was a nerd. I thought I was really cool. You had good. Uh, you good can laugh at that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I had good self esteem, but I think I I I, I mean I grew up I I was born in fifty three so by the time I was ten it was sixty three and the Beatles came out and you know thing. It was the 60s, and I really latched on to that. The music, the culture, everything. So I identified with that when I was pretty young. My, my brother was listening to Peter, Paul, and Mary. That was like, you know, pre-Beatles and that stuff. But, um, and Chicago had all kinds of really cool radio stations. And, uh, just uh, soul, funk stuff that probably just from being Chicago and I was tuned into that also so it was art and music kind of got me through definitely got me through junior high and high school yeah when did you get into uh, visual art because I know you're also a visual artist um, pretty early on and I w mostly hung out in the art room art department in high school and went to art school and got my BFA in painting and sculpture. Was uh, creativity or art something that was encouraged in your household? Like were your parents supportive of those kind of creative pursuits? Yeah, we had piano lessons and when, you know, like I said, you know, the Beatles were on Ed Sullivan and then I got all, I wanted a guitar and they bought me a guitar. But I couldn't play it because the action was about that far. Flanuck, I couldn't understand why I couldn't play it, but now, looking back, I, I got it. But um, yeah, th then I think somewhat encouraged, but more, I think, because they wanted us to be well-rounded more than they wanted us to be musicians. My brother was a really good pianist, but they kind of pushed him into law school. And then uh, that's a whole other story. So were so academics were like very important to them too. Maybe to them, yeah, not to me. Um, so piano was your first instrument. How how old were you when you d took piano, and then how old were you when you forced your parents to buy you a guitar? <laughs> forced them? <laughs> yeah. Uh, probably you know ten or eleven. Oh, okay. Um. But I didn't play the guitar because it was too hard, and they were, it was an acoustic with really high action, and they gave me some guitar lessons, you know, Swanee River and stuff, and that's not really what I wanted. 
So I kind of just moved into art and thought, and listened to music constantly. Um, what was your high school experience like generally? <sighs> um, it was... Like I said, I hung out in the art department. It's where all the kind of, you know, misfit kids hung out in the art department. And so, but there, you know, it was, it was the 60s, early 60s, mid 60s. So there were a lot of drugs, a lot of experimenting at way too young age with, you know, LSD, marijuana, speed. So that was all going on when I was like 14, 15, 16 in high school. I know when I graduated from high school at 17, I had given up LS acid and pot because I was like, I, I could tell I was losing my mind from it. The, the drugs were, you know, part of the culture at that moment. And I was really into the music of that moment at that time. It was amazing what was going on. The you know late sixties rock and roll. And what were your? Um, so now you said you went to art school, mm -hmm. college. But what were your kind of expectations for yourself after high school, going into college? Did you plan on kind of being some kind of artist? Uh, you said your parents pushed your brother into law school. Where did mm -hmm. they like want you? Not yeah, they to were trying art? to push me towards commercial art or advertising or something. But I was very um, willful about staying with fine art, and I did. And then I had a chance to um, uh, get. I I I had had it with the school in Illinois, and I got a scholarship to finish up a summer program at Skidmore in Saratoga Springs. So I got my last nine credits there. I met some kids who were living in New York. They said, come stay with us. And so I was 21 and I came to New York and got a job at Pearl Paint. And, uh, you know, just it went on from there. But no, I came, I really came to New York City to be a visual artist. And I was had started the process of applying to the Whitney program, um, and I was I actually had shows, and um, I was you know kind of participating in the art world. But then, what happened is my brother got sick. He was living in San Francisco. He was gay. He was a lawyer. He got cancer and died. And I w went to to visit, stay with him for a few months before he died. So I'd been in New York about a year, uh, working at Pearl Paint, doing art, going to art openings. You know, it was like amazing in the mid '70s in New York. The art world was much more cohesive than it is now. And um, um, I think his death really rocked me, and I came back and. I got an unemployment somehow, and I started going to CBGBs every night. Mm -hmm. And what was going on there was amazing then. Every single night, it was someone amazing was playing, like, I mean, you know, the Ramones, the Talking Heads, Patti Smith, Blondie, television, you know. Um, and then the no wave thing started happening. And then that's how I got pulled in. To that because as in art school I moved very quickly to data because that I that made sense to me Marcel Duchamp was my hero and I felt like the no wave thing was kind of music's answer to Dadaism you know that it's kind of nihilistic and and you know deconstructing the music world even deconstructing punk or you know, really taking it further. It was almost some almost performance. And um, so that really spoke to me. And I I don't know what got in. I just I would just go over there often by myself and just hang out every night. Mm -hmm. And that's and I met James and James Chance at C V. Did CVs. he come up to you? 
He did. He introduced himself to you, right? Yeah. yeah. And did you really play? You didn't play no. an instrument, yeah. not really, did you? No. Did you no. just look cool or something? I, I had crazy hair. <laughs> and he came up and he said, well, I, ac I mean, I was actually, I, I was hanging out with one of my art buddies and we had a bass. He had a bass, and I would, you know, we were trying to figure out how to play it. And so James came up to me at CBGB's, literally to the bar at CBGB's, and said, oh, I really like your hair. I'm starting a band. Do you think you're, do you play an instrument? <laughs> I was, you know, and I said, Oh, yeah, I play bass. He said, Okay, well, here's the address. Show up, you know, for rehearsal. So I went. It was, I can't believe I did that. And um, it was on Delancey Street. It was at uh, where, uh, Sumner and uh, Lydia were living at the time, Lydia Lynch, and it was really obvious that I couldn't play bass. So he said, well, do you think you could play guitar? And I thought, yeah, I can do that. I mean, I can play slide guitar the way Lydia does or the way Connie Berg did in Mars or Ardo did in DNA. I kind of got like the hang of that. So we, you know, I joined the contortions and started playing guitar. And, you know, the first gig, I think I'd been playing with them for two weeks. How would you... It's just so funny to talk to people like you and Lydia and to talk about these, like, really seminal bands, like the Contortions, who, in actual, like, that was a year or, like, a year and a half of your life or mm -hmm. something. Mm -hmm. Like, you didn't even really play that many shows, did you? You played mm. in the city. We played bunch. in the city a lot. Yeah. Like... Probably there was a moment where we were playing every week in the city. Okay. Because there were a lot of clubs and a lot of different, like even just pop up places, and we were playing a lot in the city. Um, but yeah, no, we played Chicago, we played Paris, mm. and New York. That was it. How would you kind of summarize your year and a half? Oh, what's in something? Toronto, sorry. And Toronto. Okay, <laughs> Chicago, Paris. Toronto, right. New York, yeah. Contortions. So yeah, you're right. It was a really small and short yeah. scene. And what were the? How were you guys received, like in New York, by audiences? Where it was. Well, this. I mean, it just caught on for some reason, and we started playing mostly Maxes and CBGBs, and then these other clubs were opening, like Hurrahs. These kind of more bigger clubs like and um well we would sell out maxes and it would kind of attract an art crowd too because it was pretty arty and james hated soho and the art crowd so that's when he would start getting into tussles with people but really it was just you know being like anti everything like and we would just be on stage you know going over what we had done at rehearsal we never knew what he would, he, he would never say to us, listen guys, I'm going to go out into the audience and start a fight. It would just happen and we'd just be watching. We were, would be just as surprised as the audience, yeah. as to what was going on. It was, um, <laughs> cra yeah, it was kind of crazy. How would you uh, summarize your, your experience in the contortions? Uh, I think I kind of liked it. I stayed, I did it. Um, it was interesting and it happened really fast and it was kind of fun. And, and I liked, you know, trying to play music. I liked the musical part of it. Um, and being part of that scene gave you something to feel that, you know, you were part of a collective something. And it was kind of a cool scene. And, uh, you know, I don't know. It just, you know, basically it, ha it all happened so quickly. You know, it would be like, okay, we have a gig next set. And so you just, we, we were just on auto. Yeah. And, um, and then it was over. So I, I know this is really boring, but I do always wonder, <laughs> um, <laughs> were you like still on unemployment at the time or how did you all make money? Cause it seems like when you're like playing that much and people, you know, like Lydia has told me how she made money because she was like, I wanted to do my art all the time. So it was kind of like 
Mm-hmm. I'll call it like underground ways to make money. But what did you all do to like survive and live and eat at the time? Well, the contortions actually, we we made money playing. And the clubs would pay us, but you know, I would have a couple roommates, and I, you know, there were many days when you know the meal of the day would be one slice of pizza, or a progresso lentil soup. That was a big one. So, but we didn't, but you know, we were kids, we were in our 20s, we didn't really care, you know, it didn't, it didn't, it wasn't an issue. Yeah. It's just like we were doing what we wanted to do. But, you know, a lot of us had side jobs too. Once the contortions split up, I got a job with Laura Kennedy, who I was living with at the time, at Bleecker Street Cinema. And, um, you know, so we, and I think, Cynthia was working as as a waitress when we first started hanging out. Um, yeah, I mean there were there were ways to make money. Yeah, yeah. And then uh, what what kind of led to the like demise of the contortions? Are you leaving? Um. <laughs> if there's one thing, or what things plural? No, it's funny because I kind of hate to. I don't. I, 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 what happened, just honestly, is um, there was more and more tension between the band and James and Anya Phillips. Anya Phillips was James's girlfriend at the time, and she was kind of taking over management of the Contortions. And she saw James as being like, you know, the next big star, and that we, the band. Except she wanted me to stay with James, but the band was holding him back. So there was this growing division, and we went. We had our last gig in Paris, and um, it was kind of crazy because James did an interview with a socialist newspaper, and I, he said something anti. So anyway, there, the, the whole gig was a disaster. I think we played three or four songs and. We had to get off stage because people were pissed at what he said, had said in the interview. But anyway, the long and short of it is, Anya and James kept all the money from the gig to buy heroin and didn't pay us. And I was the go-between. This is sorry, James. I love you. <laughs> this is this is what happened. It's kids stuff. We were kids, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and um, I was the go-between, and James was trying. They were trying to get me to talk to the guys and. Then he, the guys said, no, we quit. This is over. We're not doing this anymore. So I had to choose. Do I go with the guys or do I go with James and Anya? And Laura was with me in Paris at the time. And um, I just said, I'm not doing this anymore. It was getting too crazy. And that was kind of the last straw. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, we, we all, we quit. But there had been an ongoing battle because when we were recording... Um, the Contortions record, um, or was it, it might have been James James White and the Blacks, um, they f- fired George Scott, who had been the, the bass player, and we all loved George, so there was a big battle about that, and they brought in David Hofstra, who we loved too, but, you know, it wasn't right what they did to George, and so that was the beginning of the tension between the band and James. So it was kind of, I think, just not good feelings all around. And I don't know why, I just thought, eh, fuck this. <laughs> you know, Sounds like yeah, we were in our 20s. Like band stuff, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and you just think, eh, I don't need to do this anymore. You know, you're not really thinking about the future or anything, really, but mm-hmm. the moment. Um, you didn't play music for a little while. Did, did your experience in the contortions kind of like, sour your experience playing in bands at all or no it, it i think i mean we actually laura and i started playing with d the drummer in the bush touches really soon after the contortions broke up so we would was like a couple of years or something no it was it was i think the contortions broke up in 78 or 79, and we played our first gig in uh, February of 79, I think, or 80, the the Bush Tetris. Mm. So it was really not much time in between. Um, and how did the 
Bush Tetris come to be? It sounded like kind of organically. Did you just start playing around? Or? Yeah, we would. Uh, Laura knew D, and we were just jamming. We were just doing it for fun, and it was fun to you know be playing with your friends and your girlfriend. And um, the first gig that we did, we had Adele Berté singing, but it wasn't. We could tell we were kind of going in this one direction, and she was going in another. So it wasn't really. She was kind of more formal rock and roll than what we wanted to do. And Cynthia was our best friend. And Laura knew Cynthia from art school in Cleveland. So she was my best friend at the time. I just said, Cynthia, just come in here and just sing. You can do, you know, just go, I just don't want to go out in the streets anymore because these people, they give me the creeps anymore. It's like easy. You can just yeah. do that, you know. Snakes, it's crawl, babies, you know, it's like, it's not hard. You, so she, she did it. Yeah. And we did our first gig at Tier 3. I, this is the thing I don't remember. Dee would know. I don't know if it was 79 or 80 in February, but I think we had six songs. And our next show was opening for the Feelies at Irving Plaza. And we were looking at each other like, what? We've got like six songs. How are we going to do this? And then it just took off from there, yeah. like really quickly. How did you get that gig? The feelings, you know. They offered us a gig. I mean, yeah, I know. It was kind of crazy and fast. Yeah. So we kind of had to get it together and start writing more songs. And and then it became, we were doing that full time. And soon we, we were actually making money doing it. So uh, we didn't have to have our jobs anymore. And I mean, by the time, it, like the, we, the Bush Tetris were really active from 80 to 83. So by 81 or 82, we were playing, you know, like the Mud Club, Peppermint Lounge, Dance Interior, and they were paying, you know, three, four, five grand a night. Oh yeah. No, we were making money. Oh my <laughs> money. That's, well, we were one of the highest paid bands in the city at that time, club bands. But yeah, we, we were making money, but of course we were spending it all on drugs, but you know, where were you? What, uh, it's stupid. Were you on the same label the whole, t the entire time? No, we had like five different labels. We had the worst business sense. That so we started off at Ninety Nine Records. Yeah. And he had a little store on McDougal Street, a little record store, and um, then we did our next record with Fetish in London. And uh, wait, yeah. That was Boom in the Night. And then we did um, Rituals was on, I don't know, it's up there. It's right here somewhere. I'd have to look. Um, God, I can't remember. Sorry. Is it? What, what can, stiff. Okay. <laughs> um, but so all different. Yeah, all different sort of, labels. Sort of, but indie yes, labels. Yes, all indie labels, yep. Um, but we never made an album. We always did these uh, three song EPs. Why didn't you ever do an album? You know, we just were not that together. And also, I think it's because we were women and people, the record companies weren't really taking us seriously. And that, that plays a role for sure. So the labels offered to put out, like, EPs. Mm-hmm. Um, I didn't think about that, because I was going to ask you what the sort of... It doesn't seem like in the punk scene, everyone's like, oh, gender's not an issue, sexuality wasn't an issue in the punk scene. Um, but you, you know... But in read. the record, the record business is a business. So, yeah. yeah. But I, it was also... It's not even that we didn't have our shit together, we just didn't... We were... Just, we were playing constantly so if we weren't rehearsing or touring or playing gigs in the city we were recording and it was like three years non-stop Dee and Laura quit the band Dee joined the gun club Laura went off and did something else and Cynthia and I carried on with a different bass player and drummer and um, we actually did some recording that later we put out with Roar um, 
a couple of the songs that we did with Don Christensen, who was in the original Contortions and the Ray Beats. Mm -hmm. So he filled in on drums. And um, but I got just increasingly like burned out, and I just couldn't keep it going. Um, what was it like <laughs> uh, dating someone that you're in a band with? Was that well, really you know, fun? that's always a like, disaster. Working with someone in the beginning, <laughs> it seems like uh, what could be better. But yeah, of course, it's terrible. <laughs> but you like you were able to stick it out for a while, or for was a that while, part of, okay. for a while, yeah. Um, was it a conscious choice to present yourself? Whenever I read about Bush Tetris, uh, it's like unisex-looking, androgynous. Yeah. Uh, you know, no wave. Um, disco band was that a conscious decision or was that just what you looked like and what your friends looked like well it, yeah i mean it, it was what we looked like it, you know we weren't i don't think i mean i think by that time we had all or if if you came to new york in the 70s and you ended up in lower manhattan where it was burned out and trashed you were a misfit coming from all over the country, you know, art students, you know, just, it was a place to be and unite with other like-minded people. So, yeah, that's who we were. So, no, it wasn't intentional, and we weren't thinking, oh, wow, look at the Go-Go's, so they, they look like girls, maybe we should do that. We weren't thinking of the, you know, the commercial side of it at all. We were just doing what we were doing, literally, and, you know, I don't even think we intentionally thought, well, it would be really cool to have a girls' band, because it wasn't a girls' band. Yeah, you had that one guy. We had <laughs> the one guy, D, the drummer, and we had a, another guy in guitar for mm -hmm. at the first few gigs, too. So it was just a matter of, you know, wanting to play music. and you know, Was the fact that you were it. mostly women a point of interest in the scene? So we talked about the record. Industry. Yeah, I think I think it had something to do with with the popularity and the uh, it made it unique. And I mean, we got a lot of slack. We, you know, I I just remember hearing all kinds of things from these guys on the scene at the time, just going, "What the hell? What what, what are they doing?" You know. But I think because of that, people liked it too. How did your um, sound develop? Was it like a collaborative effort? Did you go in kind of knowing that you wanted to, you know, kind of mix uh, like funk and and punk and, and whatever, whatever yeah. else it was? Yeah, all, with all kinds of genres we had going on in there. Um, I, no, we it that wasn't intentional either. It was more like let's. You know, we were in the studio, probably smoking pot and drinking beer, and and just jamming. So, and I really didn't know what I was doing on guitar, so I was totally experimenting. And then when we found something we like, we'd go, okay, try to remember that. And then, you know, it would turn into a song. Yeah. So, but what we had our influences. We all listened to a lot of music, and we were we loved music, so. We had stuff that we brought in, and I definitely brought in, you know, the funk thing from James. And I learned a little bit from Jody Harris on guitar, you know, some of the basic funk stuff. So I took my version of that and kind of, you know, distorted it. And then, yeah. And then, and then when we started playing um, the West Coast and playing with bands like Flipper and... Um, I, that influenced me a lot, so we brought that back into it. So it probably got a little like heavier yeah. as we went on. But at first, it was like really experimental. Yeah. Did you ever, at any point, um, because you did you you said you were able to make money and you did you were able to like play music and kind of make a living. Um, but you said that you guys didn't really have a long-term plan. Did you hope to achieve any kind of like commercial success that would allow you to just kind of keep playing in the band or doing what yeah, you loved or not really? It's funny. Um, 
Now, you know, it was so in the moment and things were just happening so quickly. I was not thinking about the future. I think Cynthia was a little bit because she said she saw it crumbling. And a lot of it was, you know, there were drugs involved and stuff. And um, she was devastated because she kind of, I think she had a vision for it. But I think we were just like, you know, getting through the day. Okay, we've got a gig tomorrow, you know. Um, does that you said answer Cynthia, you? Yeah, yeah, no, it does. Okay. okay. You said that um, that Cynthia saw it crumbling. And I feel like drugs seem to be like a really big part in the <laughs> demise of bands, especially from that era. But yeah. it, maybe um, it doesn't get as much attention or something. I don't know. I feel like people don't talk as openly about it. But how much was just it wasn't working out and then how much was the were the did the drugs play a part in the the breakup the drugs played a big part in the in the breakup yeah like just a mess just you couldn't you guys couldn't um Laura was she, yeah she she was kind of a mess when she left um I got really ill I got endocarditis and I had to go in the hospital for six weeks from drugs and basically it took me a year to recover from that so that was the end really that's when it really the bush tetras ended for that period of time because I couldn't play anymore you that you didn't get sober until 86 with, okay yeah so that was still a few more years before there were a few years yeah. where I just messed around. I did art, and I think I was tired of it. You know, it was it was a burnout, and at a certain point, you kind of had to fuel yourself. It's why I think so many musicians become drug addicts too, because you, you know, the, the show must go on. You've got to get up there and perform. You've signed, you've got a contract. You've got to do it. There are nights that you do not feel like doing it, and so. You know, bang, whatever you have to do to do get yourself up to do it. So there was, I think, there was a burnout level too that I could see, and was happening to me, and I thought I needed a break from it. But I actually, literally, you know, was forced to for health reasons. Yeah. Yeah. Um. And then, yeah, so you said you were painting, like, what were you doing those years before you finally got sober? And then how did you finally get clean and sober? Um, well, <laughs> that's a whole other story. I, um, it, it, it got, yeah, I was painting. It got really, really, we got deep into it. I was living, living with someone who was selling drugs and we got arrested and I got put into rehab and I got sober so oh the courts put you in rehab uh you know the DEA oh my god that's a way cooler story than mine man <laughs> <laughs> oh I gotta hear yours but it's not that they, they they put me and they were like okay you guys are, you know you're either you know getting arrested and going to jail or you're gonna you know or here are your options. So, wait, and you went in like with a partner, or a e, well, yeah, yeah. Cause you know what they say about that? That doesn't work. So no, you like beat the, the odds. The 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 partner <laughs> stayed home and got clean with the DEA agents sitting here next to her every day. Yeah. Yeah. So it was it was a bust. Yeah. And they gave us options. We were lucky. Okay. And then, uh, <laughs> I love this. how was, uh, entering life again as like a sober person? It was you know, like, weird. Plays music and does it, art. No, it was, it was hard. The first few years were difficult. And it's funny because the first time that I started playing again sober, because I couldn't imagine doing it sober, was, um, Lydia asked me to, uh, join a band with her called Harry Cruz with Kim Gar Gordon and um, that really cool girl drummer and I can't remember her name right now. You yeah, neither. But I had 
fucking she, dinner with her. She's great. She is so good. Yeah. Oh, my God. I know. Wait, but you weren't in that. But you said well, no. I, I I rehearsed with them, and then they were going to go on tour in Europe, and Lydia could see that I was in no shape, and she, Lydia was actually really kind about it. She came to me, and she said, "Pat, I get it," you know, and she she gave me a check for my time and rehearsals, and yeah, she was sweet, and um, but I couldn't do it. It was too soon. That was like a, I was a year sober, so it took a couple more years, and then. I think the Bush Tetras did a reunion show in like 87 or 88. And then in the 90s, I played with several different bands. I started playing again. I, I figured out how to play music sober. You can do it. It's weird, isn't it? <laughs> well, it was weird at yeah. first, yeah. And like, you I mean, you had to play in front of people. <laughs> so not talking just... Uh, in know. your bedroom <laughs> yeah 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 well and that that was, that was part of it like the performing and drinking and getting high it takes the fear out of performing but you know you learn how to do it without it so it's great and it's actually much better and more fun yeah because so unfortunately too. i don't remember a lot of what happened i was going to ask that i i always ask people I'm like how much do you actually remember or were you able to um, appreciate like any of those successes that you had or really good shows um, do you remember anything? I think so but it was so like I said it, everything was so fast and it was so momentary and it was so like okay that was great uh, here we have you know a wad of cash in our underwear and great let's go home and get high and and oh we got to play tomorrow night so it was just fast and furious and I, you know, I don't know if there was a lot of time to bask in the glory, you know. Yeah. <laughs> really, it wasn't, it wasn't about, it was about like, like keeping up the pace. Yeah. Um, how did you meet Maggie Estep? I met Maggie in the program. And I'm, I'm not supposed to say this, so, but yeah. We That's were, probably we were, why we were, let's just say out. we were we were sober friends. Yeah. Okay. Um Yeah, cuz I I couldn't figure out. I was like, I'm like, yeah, but how did Pat ever meet this like MTV? I remember her from MTV. Yeah. yeah. But I didn't remember that band that you were in together and Yes, um, Maggie S. Step and I Love Everybody. Yeah. And we actually toured opening for Hole. We did about I think 12 uh, it, it was um, us, Baruch Assault, and Hole. Yeah. Do you uh, guys know that? I mean, I know. Uh, I was like, uh, uh, and they they were touring for um, the the great CD and lived through this. Yeah. 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 And um, yeah, that was fun. And that that was a, that band, Maggie Estep band. We were all it was a sober band. So we all knew each other from in that way, yeah. which was cool. Yeah, it was fun. Um, and then did that so soon after that, Bush Tetris got together again. Did how much fun you had on that tour have anything to do? I mean, did you miss playing with them or why? Well, Maggie didn't. Maggie wanted to go back to writing. She didn't want to do music anymore. She, we did one CD, and then she did a CD on her own, and she just wanted to write books. So, I had um, I played. Julia Murphy was the bass player in in with Maggie. So we went on, and I had three other bands with Julia in the '90s. We had a band called Alice, that was um, all girls. It was Adele Berté singing. Kathy Ray Samuels on guitar, who was in the Bloods, and me and Julianne bass, and we had a girl drummer, and I can't remember her name. Um, <laughs> I'm bad with names. Um, she was great. She's a great drummer, and we would do. We did only covers of like guys heavy, like hardcore, like we did ACDC, Bad Company, Stooges. And we played about six gigs. People loved it, but it didn't go anywhere. Yeah. So we had that band, and then we, I was in a band called Joey's Oscar with Julia, and I played with them for about two years. And we got that's one of the songs that I have on the um, uh, the Basquiat soundtrack. 
the song is called She Is Dancing, and that was a whole different kind of music for me to play. It was kind of, I was playing more like this lead, melodic stuff, and I just, I just went with it. It was like, okay, this is, this is good. We're playing music. We're making money. Let's, like, go, let's do it. Yeah, I'll do it. And then, uh, what happened? There was another band in there, too, somewhere. But, um, then, no, you know what? Joey's Oscar was before Maggie, so... That's what got me back into really playing again. And then Maggie, I went into social work school because I thought, okay, I got to do something serious here with my life. This is music stuff isn't going to you know, last. And uh, Maggie called and said, well, we've got you know, $10,000 for you if you come and in publishing from, for the band. So I said, yeah, I'm broke. Let's do it. So, so much for social work. You never went back? <laughs> no. You could still go back, you know? Uh, yeah, I could, but I don't want to. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a good idea in theory, but um, uh, anyway, um, so that ended, and that's when the Bush Tetras started up again, and we made two CDs in the, in the late, late 90s. What was the, what was the difference well, we all had been in different bands at that point, so when we got back together, we had we brought that experience of the other bands with us, and we were better musicians. I actually was really influenced by watching Hull. I didn't like their music initially, but I, by the end of touring with them, I loved it. So I was kind, of, and I was, and that was you know the '90s grunge, Alice in Chains, Soundgarden, Nirvana. Uh, Pearl Jam, all those bands, those grunge bands, kind of, I I thought, yeah, I want to, you know, I kind of want to write songs. Like, let's see if we can really, like, write songs. So that first record that we made that Nona Hendrix produced called Beauty Lies was our attempt at, you know, really trying to write songs rather than just do these kind of weird jams that turned into songs. Or, I don't know, there, there was a little bit of a different approach. Yeah. Um... Do you consider yourself uh, more of a visual artist or a musician? Do you consider yourself a musician and an artist? Um, yeah, I mean, I do. That's what I do. Yeah. I play music and I make art, so, you know, that's kind of... But I, I feel like it's almost kind of sometimes pretentious calling yourself an artist. A musician, I, I do play music and... You know, um, it, it's funny at different periods, different, uh, there was a time recently, a few years ago when Cynthia moved to LA for three years and the band was not happening. Um, I was doing, I had a few, I had a gallery on Orchard Street and I was doing a lot of art. So I thought, oh, this is what I'm going to do now. But then she came back and we started writing and we got a bass player who would tour with us and, you know and write with us because Julie didn't want to do that anymore. So we just put out a new EP and it did well. And uh, we just recorded at Third Man Records, uh, three songs with Jack White. And that will be out in a couple months. And we're looking at, you know, the future. We've got six new songs we want to record. So it's kind of just, ha you know, like it did before it has a life of its own. You kind of just go with it. Yeah. And I don't know if it's exactly what I want at this moment in my life, but, like, it's what's happening, so, you know. Um, when you yeah. weren't playing music for while well, Cynthia was away for those few years, like, do you feel like uh, something is missing if you're not doing music or if you're not doing visual art? Are those kind of like firmly rooted parts of your yeah I have to be doing one or the other yeah 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 it's pretty obsessive actually yeah <laughs> it's just something all the time yeah and what is it like uh touring to me doesn't sound like an enjoyable experience which is part of the reason that I like stopped playing music because I was like I hate this mm -hmm. I'm an introvert I like to mm -hmm. be at home mm -hmm don't like sleeping on people's floors and yeah, shit. Yeah, yeah. Um, how, how are you approaching your music career now compared to like when you were 
younger, the first incarnation of the Bush Touchers, and you worked constantly. Like, how do you kind of navigate that? So well, we out? we have limits with the uh, booking agents or the whoever we're working with, and we'll say, you know, we don't want to play three nights in a row at midnight. We can't. And we have to have hotel rooms. And, you know, if we can't have that, then we, we don't do it. So it's, you know, and it has to be, it, it's, it's limited, but we've been doing it. So. Do yeah. you enjoy it more now? Uh, I enjoy playing. The traveling and the touring is difficult. It's a, it's a little hard to take care of yourself on the road. Um, this is kind of a, sometimes people get mad at me because it is a gendered question, mm -hmm. but I'm also just like a very curious person mm -hmm. and I would ask guys if I cared enough to interview them, um, but I don't, <laughs> um, how, <laughs> diff like how difficult mm -hmm. is it to maintain not even like romantic relationships while you're in a, in a band and traveling all the time, but to maintain, um, kind of like long, meaningful relationships with people outside of your band like is it possible uh, well yeah because I've had so many different chapters so I have a lot of long-term friendships mm -hmm. and relationships well, that's a whole other thing and right now I have a long-distance relationship anyway so yeah it's um uh, but yeah, it does affect those things. And I think in the long run, I think what Cynthia is saying and what I think I, I agree with is, and a lot of bands are doing this now, you just go out for short periods. So you go out for a couple of weeks at a time, yeah. not like, you know, six months. I mean, yeah, if you're a huge band and you're, you know, making shit loads of money and you go on tour for six months, but that's not what our level band would do so yeah I can go out for a couple weeks yeah I think long-term relationships sound better anyway or what long-term relationships sound better anyway sound better that's than... like my goal than being around someone all the time constantly oh you mean you mean long distance yeah yeah loved that LA, <laughs> <laughs> LA. well um. yeah depends on what you want <laughs> <laughs> yeah right like to be by myself 90% yeah, of the yeah, time. Well, you and your dog, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I have Andy. Yeah. Andrew can't. Well, that fills a big hole, you know? Yeah, he's got, he, there's not enough room for all these people. <laughs> <laughs> need an extra king, <laughs> California king bed. Yeah. Okay, so I have uh, like a bunch of questions that I ask everybody okay. at the end. Um, what are your thoughts on the visibility of women in rock history? in general is there a gender discrepancy is it not really an issue is it better now than it was what do you think <laughs> um i think it's better now than it was i think there's definitely a gender discrepancy discrepancy um it's definitely male dominated and uh but i think a lot of women have come through which is great I just bought a guitar last week, and so I was up at a guitar center, and I couldn't get one of those guys to pay attention to me. And some a guy that was in there, and I was playing because I, I needed to buy a new guitar, and he was like, well, he started talking to me, and I said, yeah, if I get one of these guys to help, help me, and he said, well, you know they're not helping you because you're a girl, right? I said, yeah, I know. I've experienced it all my life. And on the way out, I was taking the guitar out, and the guy said, oh, is it your first guitar? And I was with Cynthia, and Cynthia's like, <laughs> No, she's been playing for 30 years, you know, like, fuck you. Um, so, yeah, that's, you know, and you go up there to the Guitar Center, and it's all these guys sitting around, you know, and it, it's just, yeah, and you've, I've had to deal with that, and early on at sound checks, these, you know, the sound men, you get up there, girl guitar player, they are just rolling their eyes, you know. So... But what about now that now that you're like royalty, like at South by South, we're South by South. By yeah, South no, we, we, don't, we don't get it so much anymore. No, because I think it's true. We have we've got an established name and people and also guys are different than they were 30 years ago. Mm. I think the younger guys are more kind of feminist and more open to it. A lot of them. So um, but, you know, like 
I don't know. Have you heard any of that Joni Mitchell interview that came out a couple years ago? No. Oh, it's so good. Yeah. I mean, her her talking about what she went through when she put out uh, Blue, and these and all the guys said you can't you can't show your emotions like that. You can't do that. Yeah. And it's that record is you know a classic. But anyway, yeah, it's it's an issue, mm -hmm. definitely. Um. This question is sort of about the title of this project, <laughs> which I decided to just ask everyone that I interview because I'm curious. I mean, I think it's stupid too, but I don't know what else to call it. Um, how do you feel about the category women of rock or women in rock? Is it helpful or hurtful? Is it still necessary or is it unnecessary? Would it be more productive to just get rid of like gendered categories? Mm -hmm. No, I think it's good because it's the truth. I mean, it's fine. Yeah. yeah, women in rock. I mean, I guess with all the you know transgender stuff, it could be it's going to be them or they or in rock or what. I, I mean, but there is that women in rock. Mm -hmm. It's real. It's a reality. So I think it's fine. I like it. Yeah, I just didn't want to call it like the non cis male oral history project that doesn't <laughs> well, have the same ring to it nah, I think <laughs> women in rock is cool. I mean I, 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 I get what you uh, yeah it, you might it might seem a little too uh, I don't know obvious yeah. or, uh, but it has has there been anything titled that uh, that like you're doing no so you're doing you're the first to do it so it's great yeah hear that yeah. everyone yeah <laughs> <laughs> This is going to be an Instagram clip. <laughs> um, okay, and here are the two Oprah questions. If you feel like you're going to cry, let me know, and I'll give you a tissue, like really slowly and dramatically. Okay. Okay. What are you most proud of, personally and or professionally? <sighs> um... <laughs> I would say, um, the most important thing to me is I'm really happy that I'm sober and that I can have the consciousness to try to be a kind, good person in the world and contribute. And if my music is contributing to and making someone else's life happier or better in some way, then great. So that's, that's, or my art or, you know whatever I, I I'm not doing it I'm not out there I, I I'm not a person that's doing it from an ego place because it doesn't satisfy me in that way but when I think of it as some almost like a service which also sounds kind of pretentious but like you're doing this and you're one and you know we're all enjoying we're all out there to try to have a good time and we're doing it together so that's kind of great that's kind of how I, I see it. Does that make sense? Answer your question. Yeah. yeah. And how do you feel about your role in and contribution to rock history as a whole? Um, wait, I don't need the tissue. Is there something wrong with me? You're with dead my answers? inside. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, they're not really. Sometimes I'm surprised because people will think, it, it could be a, a personal question, you know, yeah. what are you most proud of? So sometimes it stirs stuff up, and, and I don't mean to, but... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so now I, kind of, I try to diffuse it at the beginning by making a joke about it so people don't yeah, cry, yeah. and then right, we have to, like, right. stop, yeah. That's, you say the last question again? <laughs> um, how do you feel about your role in and contribution oh. to rock history? Um, I, I don't... I, I I really don't know how it plays in the broader sense of things. I I'm I'm not sure how much of an impact the Bush Tetras have had or will have. I I don't you know got our place in history except that yeah we were women doing music in the eighties and we're we're still doing it but it's it's still we're doing alternative stuff so it's not it's never going to be mainstream or commercial i don't think i mean i don't see it being that way so um 
it's it's kind of a small contribution. I mean, um, I don't know. I don't know how I see it. I, I, I don't know. Can you help me <laughs> with that? Um, can I help? <laughs> well, I mean, I, mean, I think I mean, it's. A, I I don't think one sees oneself really. I don't and, think so either. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. Um, it's sort of interesting to me when people can very easily answer that question because I mm. think like it's <laughs> weird. But I, I think that there are like. I think when we think of rock history, or, or when I do, I have to. Um, force myself to think outside of like the the canon like the jimmy page or whoever um because bush you know like i wouldn't think of a band like the bush tetras on that same canonical level but you're on like a punk underground right right yeah but we're not going to make it into the rock and roll hall of fame no, I mean, but I mean, who does? Like, that's just yeah, yeah. Well, bullshit. I mean, a lot of bands that I would love make it into that. So, you know. Yeah. It's um, but um, yeah. We we well, there's there's a role, I'm sure, and I'm sure I hopefully we've influenced other younger women to you know feel okay to go play music, and that's cool. I mean, you're still playing too, like. How many years? Like, how long ago were the '80s? Like, you're still doing it, I and know. people are what still coming to see you. Yeah. So. Yeah, I know. And I that's mean, that cool. really means something yeah. because this is a really pretty ageist culture that it's we true. are living in it's as true. well. So. Yeah. I think that's kind of a testament to how important you are. Yeah. I yeah. I think that's we were kind of surprised by that too. Happily surprised. That people, there's, we still have an audience, and a lot of younger people are coming and really digging it. So that's cool. See, yeah. so there you go. Yeah, it's <laughs> good. Um, is there anything that you want to talk about that is like an important part of your story that I didn't ask you or that we didn't touch on? Any um, like glaring omissions? Not that I can think of. I feel like you pretty much covered it with all your questions what's your astrological sign Scorpio I love Scorpios I'm not supposed to like you I do I love Scorpios that's weird do you know all of your other signs like your rising sign yeah what what do you mean why you're not supposed to no because I'm a I'm a Gemini but I'm a May Gemini oh okay I know no don't be afraid it's May May 25th I'm on the Taurus cusp I have a lot of earth that's why I'm such a hard worker oh I yes. hate Geminis and and Scorpio and Taurus have totally. Cynthia's a Taurus. We, yeah, we have, I'm on that cusp. Yeah. So um, don't you worry. About <laughs> <laughs> um, what's your moon sign? Um, moon is uh, Aries. Okay, and what's your rising, rising sign? Capricorn. So is mine. Oh, well, there love you my go. Capricorn rising. That's just, probably why you're such a hard worker. Yeah. And you're dark, and we are both drug addicts. That's like part of Capricorn. Oh, really? I it. thought it was my Scorpio because I've no. got a lot of stuff in Scorpio. I mean, it probably is too because yeah. you got that dark, but Capricorn. It's Cap oh, I thought oh. I just saw like a bird, but it was the water. <laughs> <laughs> well, it um, could be birds. Okay. We don't have to leave that in there, but I asked everybody. I interviewed Terry Nunn from the 80s band Berlin. Uh -huh. And her mom was uh, was like a professional astrologer. Oh, cool! So we talked about it for like twenty minutes nice. in her interview. Yeah, oh, I love it. No, I, I love astrology. Love astrology. <laughs> well, it's funny because my current girlfriend is a Gemini, but on the cusp <gasps> of Cancer. Oh, so, the other side. Okay. Yeah, so that saves it. Yeah, that's okay. My yeah. mother was a Gemini. A June one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you can tell because you made that face. <laughs> that's that's the face people make when that's they the thing, June. associate June. June Gemini's are the worst <laughs> they're a totally different breed they oh. suck no oh actually lydia's a june but she's june first so is that's she? fine oh, i didn't even yeah, know she's that she's june wow. first her and uh marquis de sade of course <laughs> of course well they're so, definitely related okay well i guess i should say thank you for doing these well interviews. thank you thanks <laughs> for on. doing these interviews thank you yeah it's good <laughs>